Uh, the next recommendation uh, is near and dear to me and Black and Beach and a lot of people in the room. It's really about capacity building, and it is our recommendation to help move forward the much needed uh, vocational training, educational training to close the gap in many, many areas to accommodate the sectors that are here and other sectors that will eventually grow out of these emerging economies. So I will turn it over to Mr. Wilson. Yes. Thank you, Karen. Um, as you said, the big focus here is on closing the gap in uh, human capital skills. Really three aspects to the recommendation. One is to bolster the existing uh, U.S. training programs, and Raham will talk to us about that. And then uh, I'll finish up talking about enhancing resources for U.S. TDA and pri prioritizing healthcare sector uh, training. So, Rahama. Thank you, Joe. So in terms of le leveraging cross-agency collaboration, we have four areas. The first one is expand the skills training program within the Young African Leaders Program, both in the U.S.-based programs and the follow-on opportunities in Africa. The second is harness the convening power of the U.S. government by instructing U.S. embassies to host education and business leaders to provide advice on redesigning local curricula for, voc for vocational and technical training programs around market skills gap. The third is to involve the U.S. Department of State, excuse me, Department of Education and Labor in vocational and technical training program design, including leading a delegation of U.S. vocational school directors to Africa to strengthen linkages and knowledge sharing. And then the last is to create a global framework devoted to workforce development within the Global Development Alliance, focusing on agriculture, transportation, healthcare, and supply chain management. And then in terms of the second aspect of this, uh, we do strongly recommend enhancing resources for USTDA. Um, it's estimated that the USTDA generates $74 in exports for every dollar programmed. Um, and as uh, uh, some of our own personal experience in this, um, you know, healthcare is no different than some of the power things we just heard about. There's, a, for example, in our industry, there's a number of uh, radiation treatment machines that don't have the training available, and so the asset sits idle. You know, a, really a, a, a travesty. Um, we'd love to, uh, you know, certainly the council strongly supports the 2017 fiscal year appropriations request and uh, recommend that the administration provide the financial resources to fund the USTDA programs with some uh, additional uh, enhancement su support for project implementation assistant, uh, assistance, um, kind of expanding again beyond power. Uh, replicating the Global Procurement Initiative. Um, uh, believe it or not, this is very helpful to, to customers as they really kind of figure out how to tender, what's needed um, beyond kind of the capital equipment, and how do they think about the ongoing uh, maintenance and support and education and training, um, and bringing more transparency to that, uh, very helpful. And then incorporating as well um, the training and workforce development into the reverse trade missions. Since the, uh, just this year, we've had a number of uh, reverse uh, training missions. We've recently hosted both Nigeria and Kenya. It was a fabulous job um, pulling together those, those teams. And, uh, you know, it was, it was as valuable for us, you know, as Africa, U.S. business, as it was for them, you know, with, as collaborators in their own countries, you know, financing, project management, healthcare professionals, in, in this particular case, it was uh, really a terrific job, and uh, certainly extending that would be terrific. And then the last aspect here is prioritizing the training for healthcare workforce development. You know, I was thinking of a way to illustrate this best, and it might be cervical cancer, the largest killer of age 30 to 60 year old women in Western Africa is cervical cancer. It's larger than all communicable disease put together. In the West, we beat this through immunization, screening, and treatment. Um, none of those skills are on the ground. Um, and yet, you know, the funding for some of those communicable diseases uh, and the training that goes with it is, is there. Um, I think for us to really swing the pendulum both from a from a from a epidemiology and healthcare point of view, um, uh, uh, and a social impact, uh, training is just uh, is just uh, is just critical for us. And you know, in healthcare, it's very reliant on the technology, 
and these, uh, these resources aren't in country. Um, uh, so there, there are a few places where those resources do exist, and I think it would be very valuable as well for extended private sector government partnership. Uh, you know, so for example, in, uh, uh, there's training resources in Africa uh, for uh, uh, x-ray technicians and radiation therapy led by the private sector, uh, sometimes in conjunction with uh, local country um, uh, efforts, but as well to have U.S. government involved in those would be, uh, would be a terrific extension of, uh, of the capacity for, uh, for skill development. Um, anyway, I think a combination of all those along with uh, human resources for health uh, 2030 can help uh, close the skills gap that we can make a, a big impact on, on disease and, and help uh, uh, as these assets go on the ground as well. Thank you. Um, we like all of your recommendations, if I can just stipulate. So thank you again. They're, no, they're really helpful, and it's clear you've put a lot of thought in this. And if I could take these in reverse order and also apologize as I've got to head to another uh, uh, event here on the compound in a, in a short while. But, uh, well, let me start at the middle and say that USAID officially and enthusiastically supports the budget request for our colleagues in USTDA, because I think you all recognizing that this is an agency that is small but mighty uh, is very important. I worked on the budget when I was here uh, and still support it where I am now. But I think one of the challenges is not enough people know what TDA does and how much money it actually generates and leverages. So we would strongly support that. On the training of healthcare workers, um, this is actually a really opportune time, I think, to look at this recommendation in a creative way. Um, we've done training forever in global health, and we continue as the, as the world's leader in global health, and that is USAID. That is uh, PEPFAR coordinated by the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator. That is CDC, HHS across the government. Um, what we're finding now is a real sea change in terms of the desire of governments in Africa is actually leading the pack on this globally of building and sustaining health systems in a long-term sustainable way to include looking at financing. So one of the things that's quite interesting, we're doing a couple large pilots on this, is we're getting an increasing number of requests from governments who want uh, help on domestic resource mobilization, effective tax administrations, because they realize they've got to sustain and grow their health systems. So that's a huge opportunity to be more strategic about training. We've kind of, I don't want to say we've gotten there completely, but the world sort of has gone to scale on uh, training at kind of primary healthcare levels, and now I think there is the space to do more that is specialized. Uh, one way we're doing it that I would like to flag that I think is going to prove enormously important is in the context of the global health security agenda that the president launched a year before the Ebola epidemic. And the, the goal of that is to, that every country, but that we also build the capacity of our partners in the developing world, be able to prevent, detect, and respond to some of the kinds of funky diseases that we're seeing and gonna see many more of. So a lot of the training that's going on now out of that and the capacity that we had to build in Ebola that we're now trying to uh, institutionalized is on laboratory capacity, uh, some of the more specialized techniques. I think your recommendation on how can we do this more effectively with the private sector is a terrific idea, and one of the things we might want to do is take a look across the board at where our American companies invested in the health sector in Africa and where might we marry that to some of the work we're doing on systems strengthening and training and kind of map it out so that we're doing more than just ad hoc. Um, Thank you for putting workforce development prominently in this. I think it's an issue uh, that we are all focused on, certainly our partners are, when they look at both the demands of their economies, but the mismatch between the demands and their workforce is the same time as they grapple with uh, the fact of an enormous and growing youth population. We do a number of uh, programs that are aimed at workforce training. We've got training embedded in pretty much everything we do. So we've trained a huge number of people through Feed the Future. Uh, we have partnerships with a significant number of African universities that is on workforce training. 
uh, and a number of other programs we can go through. I think the challenge is scale and how do we get to scale. And I think it would be worth thinking through whether there's some things that we might do to, to build on the recommendations uh, you make. First and foremost, I think with YALI, you're absolutely right. We support those regional centers and everything we have seen from YALI and its replication elsewhere uh, is that once you start that, you've got serious momentum and it doesn't take much, whether it's to the young entrepreneurs uh, or the others that are looking for other training to force multiply. And I think there's keen interest in building out on that. But a couple of other things. One is how can we think about marrying workforce training to regional economic community development? Uh, often what we're seeing is workforce training by country so that a number of small countries are training the same kinds of workers individually. I think there is space, EIC is an obvious place to start. I think you could do it in ECOWAS as well. Uh, to talk to our partners about how do they do regional workforce development because they all need, if you did a cross cut, they all need certain types of uh, training. Um, what more can be done on planning, strategic planning for workforce development? In my experience, and you may have more on this than I do, very few countries have strategically mapped out against their economic plans what kind of workforce they actually need to be growing. There's a generic assumption that you need more in STEM and more in this, but I don't know how specific it is. And I think, again, we might think about getting a group of companies together in a sector and doing something like that. Uh, I would flag the, the pilot that McKinsey is doing, uh, Generation. Uh, now, we'll see where that goes, but if that's got a recipe for scale, I think that's something that we're interested in looking at more fulsomely. The, the last two things I would mention were with you on the, the tool of a GDA. We think those have been increasingly powerful, but was the points about entrepreneurship. I just came from the Global Entrepreneurship Summit. Uh, the African representation was spectacular. Part of the challenge, though, is the laws and making sure that countries have the laws that allow young entrepreneurs uh, to flourish, because even though they're a small spark part of the economy, their contribution to job creation is disproportionate in a positive sense. And so that's something that we're trying to get as far as we can on uh, now. But we would love to, to pursue this in greater, greater detail. And thank you very, very much for making it as prominent as you have. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Um, as you can expect, I totally agree with your recommendations, um, and thank you very much um, for them. Um, the one thing that is, I do want to say is I do want to thank everyone on the council for their thoughtfulness um, with respect to the report. And Teresa made an excellent point with respect to Nigeria and people who are in the private sector who then went back and did public service. We have that in the U.S. as well. We have a lot of people who are serving in this administration. We have a lot of people who are federal employees who could be in a variety of other jobs, but they believe in the mission. And one of the things that you have done with this report, we, we've been flatlined for a number of years with respect to salaries. We can't really give bonuses. You gave the biggest bonus to them because you recognize what they did. Um, so that is extremely important in our workforce development and keeping our workforce and people on mission. So I, I wanted you to realize that that's something that you have given to them, and we really appreciate it. Um, with respect to the recommendations, um, you've heard we've been involved in Power Africa. I totally agree um, with Jay with respect to the whole spectrum. We've been involved with distribution as well as generation, and I'm really looking forward to someone doing transmission. Um, and with respect to the workforce development, um, I think one of the things people don't realize is what USTDA does in addition to trying to get exports into the market, we want to be sure that people know how to use those exports. So we provide grant funding to be able to support the use of those goods and services, because otherwise they're no good. Um, so we think that the skills development is extremely important and that the private sector plays a very important role in that. GPI, it came from the private sector. You gave us the idea. Um, we're delighted to be doing it. And one of the things that we are, have added is the project implementation manager. So especially with respect to Power Africa, um, in the past, people would do a piece and kind of leave it. Um, what we want to do is to see from the very beginning, we have a person tracking the project all the way from the day it walks in our door until it gets financing and implemented. And so it can 
pinpoint the other agencies that can help, the ambassadors, I just did this in Rwanda with the ambassador in Rwanda, to basically say, this has a problem, how do we unlock it? Let's bring all our tools together. Um, so again, thank you very much for your thoughtfulness. And on behalf of my staff, who was just so excited when they saw this, you can't imagine what you've done. Thank you. Yay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, very briefly, um, so the Department of Commerce, we've made uh, skills and workforce a priority, not just in the United States, but also recognizing the importance of this issue in Africa. Um, Assistant Secretary Jadot left, led the first ever um, education trade mission in West Africa in March. Um, and also your recommendation, and we hope it's the first of many, because this recommendation that you've made about a trade mission of vocational and technical institutions is something that we'll very seriously uh, look at and I think is a good idea. And I guess the one thing I would ask, and, and not today, but for a follow-up conversation, is to get your input on where, what destinations do you have in mind, what institutions would be good partners, if any, that you have in mind. Um, but we just see this as a great opportunity for U.S. firms to share their um, experience and their education and skills training with our partners in Africa. Thank you very much. It was a very good, robust discussion. We're, we've got three more to go through, so I'm going to try and keep it um, um, to sort of, again, eight minutes or so as we to, to get through it. But thank you for those great uh, comments and, and input. The third um, recommendation is around the U.S. commercial uh, dialogue and engagement. And I'm going to turn it over to Teresa uh, to take you through it. But I just wanted to emphasize three aspects to us that we felt, at least I felt, were particularly important. The first is we are recommending the creation of a U.S.-Nigeria commercial dialogue. And we think this is important for a forcing device, if you will, to keep pushing and maybe get at some of the issues that you mentioned, Gail and Andrew. You, you also mentioned that we can use it as a rhythm uh, to, to drive things, and that's something we think is, uh, is important and hopefully it is enduring um, uh, well beyond what we're doing. The, the second point I think that we really want to uh, reinforce is, you know, we're recommending to work with Congress to fully staff the commercial service positions in Africa. That's, we, we were, again, very impressed with what various groups of the, in the U.S. government are doing. We need the resources to be able to deliver on, on this. And so that's, we just wanted to make a particular point of, of that. Um, and then again, the third is around instituting and supporting these annual sector uh, forums in the U.S. And so Gail mentioned one on ag, ag food, which we think is a very big opportunity. It's going to be important for diversification. We think it's a huge opportunity for U.S. companies to get involved uh, in this part of the world, as well as obviously infrastructure uh, in it. So I just I wanted to point out the, the, there's three of there's many others too, but the, just to bang on about if we don't mind on, as we go through it. Um, but uh, let me turn it over to Teresa uh, just to give us some highlights. Thank you, Dominic. Um, I'll try to be very brief. Um, I must be brief. But I think the main point that I would say that, again, trying to read between the lines and why this is so important, is it because we are talking about our commercial engagement, which might be different from other types of engagement that government has. And in the context of commercial engagement, it's a two-way street. And so part of what our agenda is as the PAC DBIA is to ensure that businesses on the other side of the table want to do business with us. And we know in Africa, it's not, um, we're not the only game in town. And so we know that we're competing with other world powers in terms of being able to engage on a commercial basis with Africa. And in many ways, we are at a disadvantage given the investments that other governments have made in order to showcase their commercial capabilities. And so for this reason, we think that some of the recommendations such as um, funding for U.S. commercial service employees and other 10 in, sub in 10 sub-Saharan African countries is really important for us as, um, as the United States to be able to um, have the same type of visibility that China in particular has um, when we try to engage with business on the ground across the continent. Um, we've also recommended that the President take another trip to sub-Saharan Africa prior to January 2017. Um, his trips have been very important in raising the visibility of U.S. business on the ground, and we think that this type of visibility is absolutely essential for us to be able to um, be good business partners 
with our counterparts on the continent. So I think that's really what I will, I'll leave my comments there, is just to really emphasize that it is very much a two-way street. There's a lot of competition and that we need support from U.S. government in order for U.S. business to be able to play on a more level playing field. Um, I'll turn it over to Wale. Thank you. Thank you, Don. I, I actually think this is probably one of the most important recommendations we've made. Because uh, I think it cuts through all the other recommendations. Um, what Teresa just touched on, the idea of the president taking one more trip to Africa is so significant. Because if you think about it, the biggest challenge for commercial investors in Africa right now is the high risk perception. Um, and along with that high risk perception is what we call a risk premium that's very high. Um, the more we have engagement with Africa, companies, African countries, the more we bring down that risk perception, the more we lower that risk premium. Uh, if you think about it, the U.S. has the largest pools of capital. If you look, think about CalPERS with close to $400 billion, New York State with $200 billion, Texas teaches $200 billion. Those are some huge pools of capital that are looking for infrastructure investment they can get returns of close to 5% yield in developed markets, but would like to invest in Africa, but would expect a higher premium. If you can just get that premium down, maybe an additional 5% premium, you would find that a lot of these institutions will be investing on the continent, will help solve the infrastructure challenges that's going on, will help address some of these other issues. So I think this is a very, very serious issue. I think getting that risk perception down continuously and getting their risk premium down will encourage commercial capital and will help solve a lot of the issues. And in the process, you know, I mean, these groups all have long-term capital. Uh, they're just struggling to generate 7% return in developed markets right now. And this will help them get those returns as well. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you. Well, first of all, um, it goes without saying that the U.S.-Nigerian trade investment relationship is very important to us. Uh, and your recommendation about a commercial dialogue is a, is a very interesting one. This is something that we currently do with a number of other countries, and we found these to be an incredibly valuable tool, uh, both to be able to have a dialogue about high-priority issues and uh, an opportunity to get rid of commercial impediments, but also, as somebody mentioned, it's also a great opportunity because it's a, there's a little bit of a forcing function by having a regular regular conversation, you can deal with issues and you can really focus on getting deliverables and getting things done. Um, because not only is, is Nigeria the largest economy and the most populous country in Africa, but it's also really well positioned for long-term diversified economic growth. So making sure that U.S. companies are able to cash in on these or, or to, to take advantage of these opportunities uh, is incredibly important. Um, you know, Penny had led a trade mission to Nigeria in 2014, and we, we remain very engaged. Uh, so this, we appreciate this recommendation. I also want to just speak uh, briefly to the um, recommendation about uh, increasing the commercial service staff, uh, which is the, the foreign commercial service staff is an incredibly underappreciated resource of the United States government. And I actually think it's one of the highest value um, the return on investment of commercial service officers around the world is incredibly high for the benefit that they bring to not just American businesses but also to American taxpayers in terms of helping to find U.S. businesses and helping them with business opportunities around the world. So thank you for these recommendations. They're remarkably helpful. Thank you, Bruce. I think Bruce Wart yeah, Wharton would like to say something as yeah, well. Yeah, thanks very much. From the perspective of the Department of State, let, let me start off by thanking you all for the, the work you've done on the, on the PAC-DBIA forum. But I also want to thank in absentia my colleagues at our embassies in both the Nigeria and Rwanda and across the continent for the work that they've done to help make this meeting possible, but of course the work that they do all the time. Uh, we fully support these, uh, these recommendations, uh, especially, I think, uh, the expansion of the Foreign Commercial Service. FCS officers uh, have skills that many State Department officers simply don't have. Uh, they are a vital part of our ability to promote American goods and services and build uh, a more effective two-way trade and commercial uh, relationship with African countries. Um, so we would 
very strongly support that. Uh, likewise, we think that the U.S.-Nigeria commercial dialogue is a great idea, and, and, and the idea of, of sectoral forums uh, to, to run in parallel with the U.S.-Africa business forum makes a lot of sense to us as well. So um, let me just close with the idea that in competing with other nations, especially with the Chinese, um, I think thanks to the work that we've done on human resources over the years, whether that's the YALI program, precursors of the YALI program, U.S. education programs, uh, African women entrepreneurship programs, we have capital in Africa that our Chinese friends may not have. I think most Africans would rather do business with Americans and American businesses. So that is some capital that we ought to seek to make better use of. Thanks. Thank you. I think we're going to turn it now to the uh, fourth recommendation. So, Karen, do you want to take us through? Our fourth recommendation relates to travel routes and transportation infrastructure. As you can imagine, with the implications of a growing economy and population, there are needs around moving goods on the, on the rail side. There are needs around moving people between countries and so forth. So we put together a recommendation that uh, Jay is going to walk us through on how to improve the investment in our transportation infrastructure. So Thank, <clears throat> thanks, Karen. Um, th this, uh, this area is near and dear to my heart. M number one, we sell ra locomotives and, a and aircraft engines, <laughs> but most importantly, I fly commercially around Africa, so a lot. <laughs> so um, that's a key one. Most of the recommendations are around financing, policy frameworks, uh, studies and skills development, uh, again, uh, depending on aviation and or, or rail. And I think it's important because there's a basic policy infrastructure and things that have to be dealt with, whether it's open skies or the Cape Town Treaty, et cetera. And, um, and, and building out the aviation infrastructure from a safety standpoint on, on what's on the ground uh, at airports, et cetera. Uh, but also, uh, from a rail standpoint, uh, a lot of dilapidated rail. And one of the issues on rail, um, <clears throat> on rail uh, infrastructure is that most of it's very old, mostly built by the colonial countries that went, went in. And number two is it's very expensive to fix and or put uh, new or build new. And, uh, and that tends to be the biggest chunk of any, any rail project that, that's out there. And I think part of it is, what works with the governments, uh, cons you know, can they understand what concessions, how concessions work, et cetera. So I think all those are stuff that, uh, that you know, we recommend and I think that the uh, government can help us on. Okay. Jenny, or Wanda, you had something? Uh, Ms. Felton, XM Bank, yeah. No. No. context of um, increasingly restrictive capital and liquidity requirements from Basel III, um, the ability to mobilize that uh, private sector capital is, is fairly limited uh, without an export-import bank here in the United States. Um, as many of you may know, uh, Exxon Bank was uh, pledged $5 billion of the almost $10 billion commitment from the U.S. government, and so we're a little more than half of the pledge. Uh, we are very active in uh, supporting aviation, not just equipment, but also infrastructure and rail uh, infrastructure and, and equipment. And um, we have been out of business effectively for a, exactly a year tomorrow. Tomorrow's the one-year anniversary. Uh, we, as you all know, our uh, charter lapsed in uh, June of, on June 30th uh, last year uh, for five months. That was unprecedented. And um, we have been without a board quorum since then, so we cannot uh, vote on any transaction or move on any transaction over $10 million. So um, these things all have important implications, uh, not just for your recommendations, but also for some of the subtext 
uh, that's gone, uh, sort of been weaving through the conversation related to uh, commercial dialogue, <coughs> related to um, the ability to finance SMEs and, on, and promote entrepreneurship in Africa. Um, most um, African banks, and particularly in Nigeria, uh, do not lend to the real economy, so we can provide financing that can flow through uh, to smaller companies, not just large infrastructure projects. And um, lastly, there was a recommendation around promoting more coordination and collaboration among uh, the U.S. government agencies, and I would just suggest that Exxon Bank is an important part of that, so that um, while our uh, financing is conditioned upon U.S. procurement, that's, um, again, there was a comment early on uh, uh, about the um, opportunity uh, for mutual benefit between the United States. We can not only uh, keep jobs here in the U.S. Uh, with our financing, but we can also help create jobs in Africa. So for all of these reasons, um, I would hope that uh, there might be some opportunity to, um, as has been done with some of our sister agencies, recognize the important role that Exxon Bank can play. Uh, and I gather that the uh, report is final, but if there's some opportunity to um, discuss that as you um, make your recommendations uh, and help implement some of these recommendations, I think there might be, uh, that might be useful. Hi. Um, first, I'm substituting for Jenny Rosenberg. My name is Susan McDermott, Department of Transportation. And I'd like to say that we were thrilled to see that an entire bullet was devoted to travel routes and transportation infrastructure. We have followed around many of the trade talks with our U.S. colleagues, the AGOA summits with our U.S. colleagues, always with the message that you can't trade if you can't get there and your products are non-competitive if you can't move them at a decent, uh, uh, a decent tariff. So we were very happy to see that this is a major recommendation. Um, I'd like to say that the Department of Transportation has been active, especially in aviation, for 15 years now, even more. We deal with the basics, and that's really safety and market access. Um, uh, we do that because we want to increase connectivity to the United States, and we also saw from hearing from many of our embassies across the continent that aviation safety really needed a boost. And so for several years now, uh, we have managed what we call the Safe Skies for Africa program, which is an aviation safety program that conducts training and uh, uh, capacity building across the continent. And with that, I'd like to hearken back to the whole idea of uh, skills training. Because what we do is build the skills of government officials. We build the skills of government officials to be able to regulate smartly in aviation and um, other transportation services that are necessary to be regulated. You have to have people that inspect rail. You have to have people that inspect roads. You have to have people especially that inspect aviation. And that's what we build. Uh, it's what you called in your report the soft infrastructure, and that's what we focus on mostly. Um, I'd also like to say that we're trying to shift this now to actually providing these services on the continent. We're running a pilot program with the Ghana Aviation Training um, uh, Academy, whereby we are now training trainers so that the Ghana Academy will train people from across the continent themselves and we will not have the FAA um, uh, inspectors be moving across the continent and training in, in large bulk as we do now. Um, uh, it's something that um, uh, l very much lends to regional integration. We have done this uh, because Ghana is one of the leaders in what we call a Banjul Accord, where countries are getting together and together creating integrated FAAs instead of a lot of little FAAs that then have to satisfy what are the <coughs> international standards. We've done this with a group called COSOA in the East Africa community as well. Banjul is very advanced. COSOA is still under construction. Uh, but it is a way to integrate the countries to provide the services that they need on a government basis uh, much cheaper, much faster, and um, uh, with uh, uh, fewer human resources. Uh, I'd also like to note that Secretary Fox launched a program last year when he was on the continent called Tomorrow's Transportation Leaders. And here, too, 
it identifies uh, promising African transportation practitioners early in their careers as to how do you really build a transportation expertise inside of governments? How do you become transportation planners? How do you get these plans implemented as a government official? How do you go forward? So what we want to do, and I mean what we are best at, is transferring USG skills to foreign government skills. So um, when it comes to actual routes, we negotiate the Open Skies Agreements. We have 28 Open Skies Agreements with African states, and uh, we will continue uh, to promote other countries to accept the Open Skies Agreements and uh, uh, see how we can create an enabling environment for airlines to offer services, provided that the safety and security requirements are there. But we're very open to talking with um, uh, especially transportation manufacturers and uh, service providers as to how we can continue to assist in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Aaron, please. Yes. I just wanted to add that from the Department of Commerce, we engaged in multiple ways on the whole infrastructure opportunity. Uh, we're looking at uh, helping U.S. companies with offerings and transportation, power, and urbanization particularly. We've been working on standing up an initiative in the space, our senior our commercial officers across the continent, and thank you for the support for, the, for expanding our presence there, are very engaged uh, on this topic. Uh, I was with Secretary Fox on the, on the mission last time. It was very clear that uh, we have a lot to bring to the transportation sector as to the energy and urbanization sectors. And we'll keep talking to you about uh, getting your inputs as we hone uh, our activities in the space. I want to say that our focus is very deal-oriented. We want to make sure that deals get done for U.S. companies, along with capacity building. Thank you very much, uh, Aaron. I'm going to shift it uh, now to our final recommendation, which is on tax treaties, uh, and ask uh, Jay to just take us through well, this. I'll do it quick, Dom, yeah. Dominic. Uh, go to page 19, look at the map. Uh, we got four countries. British has, I don't know, Britain has, uh, I don't know how many in there, although they might vote them out now. Uh, <laughs> but, um, and, you know, from a standpoint of taxation, the ability to really have open and free information is key. Obviously, double taxation is a key thing as someone per as I personally do pay two taxes, uh, Kenya and U.S. Uh, so we, I think this is something that can be done. It's difficult from the standpoint of Africa's 54 countries, so you need to prioritize which ones might make the most sense. But definitely, if you think about the economic potential of a lot of these countries, I think we need, we, U.S. government, needs to think about uh, establishing treaties with at least the ones that we can leverage the most. So. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Bruce, over to you. Yeah, and, and we completely understand the Council's desire um, for our tax treaties to be proactive, not reactive. Uh, to spur investment in Africa, we need a level playing field uh, that includes tax treatment. And so we will take uh, this recommendation up with our colleagues from the Department of Treasury who are not here today, uh, but we'll definitely take that forward with them. It's always great to do recommendations when someone's not here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when we give assignments. Actually. Yeah, exactly. Good. Well, that was fast. I don't know if there's any other comments or? Okay. Any other broader comments? Because we've now gone through the five um, that we've, we've covered. Yeah, please. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, it'll be yeah. very quick. Um, getting back to the point about commercial Getting back to the uh, comments about commercial engagement, one of the biggest constraints in addition to um, what's happened with Exxon Bank here uh, in government uh, has, has been the lack of activity, active exporting by American companies. And so all of these efforts led by the Commerce Department have really increased the visibility of the opportunity and I think um, encouraged American companies to pay more attention to the opportunity. We appreciate that greatly. It's been a huge constraint on what we've been able to do. And uh, the recommendation around the commercial service officers is a very, very important one. It has helped us identify opportunities. And we found that where there have been people on the ground, it has really uh, created uh, knowledge sh uh, sharing uh, and information sharing for us is very valuable. Thank you. Thank you. Wally. 
So I want to just thank all of you for the recommendations. They are um, thoughtful, they are detailed, they're very helpful. I think what they speak to is the idea that we um, know that Africa is moving, Africa is growing, Africa is filled with opportunities. There are things that um, we need to do to help unlock those opportunities, and I think you have outlined a number of those things. Um, and I think they speak to what gives the United States an advantage. It really is the fact that we have such an active, engaged business community that is willing to think creatively about the continent. And ultimately, the only way that we are able to continue that kind of work is through groups like this and this partnership. I know that um, we are going to be renewing um, this organization, and we ask you not only to think about serving again, but think about who else should be around the table, because um, we've, we benefit greatly from your advice and your counsel, but we know that um, we need the advice and counsel of many other companies, so I want to um, put in your ear that you, so you start to think about um, your colleagues in the business community, which ones of them should be sitting around this, this table in the future. And I do want to encourage you to um, become involved with the um, US Africa Business Forum, which will happen um, in September. I think it's going to be a real opportunity for us to highlight um, some of the successes that we've had since the last business forum, but also to help build some momentum going into the next administration, because we think that it is critical that um, we not only um, do a great deal for Africa up to January 20th, 2017, but the president wants part of his legacy to be the fact that we remain economically engaged with Africa not for the next five to 10 years, but for the next 50 years. So I wanna um, thank you for the recommendations and look forward to continuing to working with you. Thank you, Wally, very encouraging uh, on that. Um, I'd like now to shift to our adoption, of the recommendations chunk, so just on the formality side. And I do this with some formality because the last time I did it, I didn't do it exactly right, so we had to have a phone call to make sure put things in case. So Tricia's probably a little nervous about this, uh, this section. <laughs> I tried to slip in a couple but there. Um, so I want to move uh, for a vote to adopt the full recommendation report, the trip report and the five uh, recommendations that we have. I will second that motion. So if this is for the PAC DBI members, if you agree with the report, please say aye. Can I get here? Aye. 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 Uh, if you disagree, uh, please say nay. Okay. I hereby announce the recommendation report adopted uh, by the council. So thank you very much uh, for that. Thank you. That's great. I'll just make some quick closing uh, comments, starting first with our thanks on behalf of the council to President Obama for his vision and support that led to the objectives that helped guide us uh, in the past 18 months. They will be very, very good objectives, recommendations that will impact uh, both of our continents for a very long time. Uh, I would also like to take the opportunity to express our appreciation to uh, Secretary Pritzker for her leadership and the ability to really help us get things done and watch her in action as we took our, our trip to Nigeria and Rwanda. It was very good. And I'll say again, thank you to everyone in the room who participated in this great effort. There are a lot of people who are not in the room that we also want to extend our appreciation to, but for everyone here and those that aren't able to be here, it's been a really good effort. One of the benefits that I take back to my workplace and my community is a public-private partnership that really came together with multiple diverse stakeholders and we arrived at a place where we now have work that can be implemented. Uh, ultimately, as I've said before, I think it's about the people and as we move toward these greater economies, I hope that it becomes the skill of the people that provides the health and prosperity of Africa for a very long time. So that's a very worthwhile investment, and I'm delighted personally to be part of it. I think what we have talked about today are compelling recommendations that warrant the extension and expansion of the Council, so I'm excited that that is going to happen here in the next couple of weeks. 
that gives us another indication that the work is actionable, it's viable, and we know who can get it done. So I, I think that's awesome as well. Um, a couple of personal observations. Again, it's been a complete and total honor for me to have the opportunity to participate in this activity. My life will forever be changed in terms of delivering infrastructure. You now get to see the people who are the beneficiaries of delivering that infrastructure. But also, as I think about uh, reliable power, it's a must. We all know that. We'll get that done. But the last bit that I will say relates to our trip to Rwanda. And as many of you know who were on the trip, the first stop we made was to the Genocide Museum. And it talked to me about the power of serving, but it also talked to me about the power of forgiveness and what has transpired in Rwanda since that episode says you can get a lot done when you pull together. And that truly left a lasting impression on me that we can get this done. Uh, the next group of leaders will get this done. So it was really a life altering trip and forever grateful that I had that experience. Thank you, Karen. I, I just want to say a couple of closing remarks, too. I think, as Karen said, a, a, pr a particular thanks to President Obama uh, for initiating this whole idea. I think the, bringing the private sector with the public sector with, as Wally said, a sort of a long-term view, a 50-year fi view as opposed to a one-year view, I think is remarkable. And I wish more leaders around the world did, did that type of, uh, type of thing. And what, again, Secretary Pritzker, who as Karen said, it isn't just her, her foresight, logic, business acumen, it's her, her energy. I mean, it was hard to keep up with her, frankly, uh, <laughs> over those, uh, those few days that we, that we had. And I think that's just, to me, symptomatic, too, of the government. And I want to say particular thanks to all of the government leaders who are here, because we got a glimpse into the great work that you do. I think in the private sector, we don't acknowledge that enough and see it. And I just want to say on behalf of all of us, a huge thank you for all the things that you do. Um, and, and hopefully in some small way, we can help you in helping us and helping the continent uh, move forward. I also want to thank uh, my fellow council members. It's been a terrific group, a fun group. We Very few of us knew each other actually when we got started, but we got to know each other very, very well uh, through the course of the last uh, 18 months. And I think the, that's been a special benefit um, of, of the process. And I particularly want to thank the council member staff, many who are here who actually were doing a lot of work in the multiple iterations of the uh, recommendations as we, um, as we went through them. Um, and particularly to Tricia, too, for uh, keeping us uh, on track and, and giving us guidance from time to time in what we're doing, we, we deeply appreciate that. So thank you, everyone, for, for everything that you've done. And, and we look forward to this mission continuing uh, and helping uh, the country move forward and play a very important, clear role uh, in Africa uh, over the next 50 years at least. Thank you very much. And with, With that, uh, we'll, we'll close uh, this session. Thank you so much.